Well, welcome to week one of a series we're starting this weekend called New. Now, by a show of hands at all of our campuses, how many of you guys would be honest and say you like new stuff? Raise your hand, all of our campuses. Raise your hand. If you're not raising your hand, you're lying in church. God's going to get you. Okay, so everybody likes new stuff, right? You get a new house, how do you feel? You're so excited. Can't wait to move in. Counting down the days to closing. You get a new car, how do you feel? Oh man, you're ready to cruise around, show your friends, hey look at me, I look good in my car. New clothes, ladies, party time, okay, you're excited about that, some gentlemen too, so it just depends, okay, and so new gadgets, I like those, okay. I'll buy a gadget and I'll track it like every day, I wonder why the UPS man is so slow, okay, I mean I'm just excited because it's new. Recently I bought a gadget, I bought lots of gadgets, okay, when I can afford it. I bought this little Bluetooth speaker, okay? Because when you play music on your iPhone, you know, it's not very loud, so you can get these speakers, you can take around with you and play. One of the reasons I got it was because my daughters like to dance. So I put my iPhone in the room and you can't hardly hear it when they're dancing. So I got this speaker so they'd be loud and we can go outside and they can dance. One dance they've been trying to do lately that they really like is the whip and the nay nay. Okay, that's just, I'm just being honest. Yes, these are preacher's kids, okay? And um, now, for the most part, they don't know how to do the nay-nay. But, thank goodness, there's somebody in the household who has had to learn recently. <laughs> and it's not my wife, okay? That's the second reason I bought it, because me and the leadership team decided we want to do a little dance for our wives, a second chance prom. So I've been keeping a secret from you and from my wife for two months, okay? I have been. It's been a lot, I mean, it took us two months to look that terrible, okay? Two, two whole months. The sweet girl that goes to our church, goes to the Raider Church, college student Katie, is a dance instructor. She did the choreography. She t tried to teach us to dance to it. And we'd get together a couple hours each week, literally for two months. Then we'd go home with a video and we would practice. So I needed the music to be turned up in my house when I was practicing, okay? So I needed the speaker. But my wife couldn't, you know, know about it. So I'd wait till she left to go to Target or something. I'd run into my study. I'd get my speaker. I'd close the blinds for sure, okay? No reason to embarrass myself. And then I'd break it down, all right, in my, in my house, trying to learn these moves. I'll never do it again, okay? I never will. But when we did it at prom, everybody was freaking out, and my wife thought it was sweet, so good enough for me, love. I said, babe, um, just want you to know your love language is gifts. That's a gift for like the next seven weeks, okay? <laughs> Don't be expecting anything else. That was a big gift. So I got that speaker is new. I was excited because new makes us excited, right? What emotions are usually associated with new? Happiness, joy, you're thrilled. It's new. New equals happy, makes us happy. Well, did you know that you can be made brand new? And if a little gadget or a car makes you happy when you get a brand new one, imagine how happy you would be if you became brand new. Now, I'm going to show my cards here at the outset. There's a passage of Scripture in the Bible that for thousands of years, people have been reading this. And once they read it, they feel brand new. It's new, so it fills them with joy and happiness. And then tens of thousands, millions of people as a result have wanted to get baptized immediately. So can I be honest? My prayer for you today is the same thing. I'm gonna read this to you. It's going to be, if you haven't heard it before, some of the best news you've ever heard in your life. It can make you feel brand new, which will fill you with happiness. And then my prayer is, if you haven't been already, you'd get immediately baptized today. You're like, preacher, um, I got nice clothes on. These are my church clothes, bro. I mean, I don't even know about that. We bought some clothes for you, okay? We've taken care of you. You're like, what brand? We're going to come back to that in a minute, okay? And... uh. But some of you came today 
not planning to get baptized, but before you walk out of the place today, you're gonna decide to go Book of Acts style and get baptized on the spot because that's how it happened often in the Bible. Somebody would hear, they would believe. They'd say, where's water? Somebody dunk me right now. You're like, dude, this better be a persuasive Bible text, okay, for me to wanna do that. Well, let's just see. You got a Bible? Romans chapter four. Romans 4, I want to show you something that has brought tremendous joy to millions of people over the last 2,000 years. And it just might do the same for you today. Buckle up. Get ready to be exceedingly happy. Romans 4, verse 1. This is Paul. Paul hated Christians, by the way. Did you know that? He tried to kill them. Then he became one wrote almost half the ancient documents in our New Testament. We should probably listen to him when he talks. He said this, Abraham, we know him, right? Father Abraham, amen. If you were in church, you know, Father Abraham, okay, was humanly speaking, who was Abraham? He's the founder of the Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? What did he discover? He discovered something. Because the Abraham was on a quest to try to find out if there was a way to be made right with God. Because see, what was true of Abraham is true of you and me. The law of God was written on his heart. His conscience would have told him that there was right and wrong. You know that there's right and wrong too, right? Even without a Bible. There's something in us, there's a standard of what's fair and what's not fair. And all of us would admit, and Abraham would admit, we haven't even lived up to our own standard. Whatever that law is, is written on his heart, Abraham knew he had broken it. He wasn't perfect. And so he felt some distance from God. He felt separated from God. You ever felt that way? Because in your mind, you know, I may not know the Bible, but I'm not perfect. And I wonder if God's going to accept me one day. I wonder if I'm going to get to go to heaven. I wonder if he loves me. Have you ever had those thoughts before? I have. Abraham had. So he's trying to discover, is there a way to bridge that gap? Is there a way to be made right with God? What did he discover? Verse 2. First thing. If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. Watch. But that was not God's way. Here's what Abraham discovered. It didn't matter how good he was, how perfect he could be the rest of his life, he knew his good deeds would never make him acceptable to God. But in our society, it's just the opposite. Everybody thinks, for the most part, most people think, the way you're made right with God is by being good. If you're good enough, if your good outweighs your bad, God can forgive you. You can get to heaven. You can be good. Abraham discovered, and I want you to discover today, maybe it's the first time in your life, that was not God's way. This is not God's way. Would you just read this starting here with this butt with me? All together, ready, set, go. But that was not good deeds don't make you acceptable before God. You're like, why not? Because if it was about being good enough, you'd never make it. Neither would I. The standard's too high. You see, what you got to realize is your future good doesn't wipe out your past bad. Even if you're perfect from this point forward, doesn't wipe out the, the fact that in the past, you've broken that law that's written on your heart, haven't you? You're not perfect. So you should be judged or punished for the laws you've broken, right? I mean, try it in a court of law. If you were to say to a judge, hey, I've committed all these crimes, judge, but here's the promise. Rest of my life, I'm gonna be so good. 
I'm going to be so good, Judge, you won't even believe it. Doesn't matter. Your future good doesn't wipe out your past bad. That's why we have a sense of, I wonder if God's going to accept me. I wonder if he's going to punish me because we sense he probably should. If he's good, he's a good judge, he probably should. So again, this is not God's way. And that should be good news to us. It's good news that good people don't go to heaven because none of us would be good enough. Begs the question, what's God's way? Glad you asked. Verse three. <clears throat> For the scriptures tell us, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Read that again. I'll give you a second. He believed God. Paul's quoting here from Genesis 15. God speaks to Abraham in a vision. Says, Abraham, I'm going to protect you and your reward is going to be very great. Abraham said, God, that's great. What good is your reward though? Your blessing in my life? I don't even have a kid to pass it on to. I got no heirs, God. God said, Abraham, you're going to have a son. Then he took him outside, said, Abraham, look up at the sky. Abraham, count the stars if you can. I'm sure Abraham's like, one, two. God, I can. There's too many. God said to Abraham, Abraham, that's how many descendants you're going to have. Put yourself in Abraham's shoes. Do you believe that? If I put myself in his shoes, I don't know if I believe that. I'd be like, God, here's the thing. My wife, Sarah, you know, Sarah, God, she hadn't been able to have kids. We've tried all of our life. She can't, God, we can't have kids. And you're going to give us a kid? And oh, God, by the way, she's 75. God, have you seen many 75-year-old women walking around pregnant? Paparazzi would be everywhere, okay? God, this doesn't happen. She can't get pregnant. She's in her 70s. I'm in my 80s, God. If I'm Abraham, I'm going, God, you're great. You're so good. I don't know if I believe that. I don't know if I believe that. How did Abraham respond? Hey, Abraham, Sarah can't get pregnant. You're 80s. She's 70s. You're going to have a child. Your descendants are going to be like the stars. How does Abraham respond? Genesis 15, 6. And Ab this was his name before. They changed it. And Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith wow even when it was hard to believe Abraham believed he trusted God he said God you know it doesn't make any sense to me but if you say it I trust you because you keep your promises. You know what God said back to Abraham? Because you believe me, you're not a righteous man, but I'm gonna count you as a righteous man. I'm gonna make you right with myself just because you believed. God, even though I haven't been good, yeah, it's not about you being good. God, even though I've broken that law. No, it's not about that. Because you trust me, Abraham, I'm going to think of you as if you've never broken a law in your life and that you're perfectly righteous. I'm just going to give it to you as a gift because you believed in me. You're welcome. Can you imagine the smile forming on his face? <laughs> yes. I'm right with God. And it's just because I believe. We learn here in the first book of the Bible the way God makes people right with himself. And it's not about being good it's about believing and then he gives us a gift because of our faith whoa so Paul keeps going explain this further Romans 4 verse 4 he said when people go to work like when people get, go to got a job your wages what you get paid they're not a gift right it's something that you've earned but, like he's saying, let me tell you about a gift now. Let me tell you about a gift. But people 
like Abraham, are counted as righteous not because of their work, but because of their faith, belief in God who forgives sinners. Here's the gift. People are counted as righteous, being right with God, not because they've been good enough. Thank you, God. I'd never be good enough. But because they believe, they have faith, and he gives them a gift of righteousness, clothes them in it, so that when Abraham stands before God or we stand before God, we're in the perfect righteousness of Christ. Previous chapter, he said this. This is how it works, Romans 3, 25. People are made right with God when they are a good person. Okay, it's not God's way, right? When they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Paul said it was to free us from the penalty of our sin, that law we deserve to be punished for. Oh, somebody got punished. It just wasn't you. Thank God. It was Jesus. He got punished for you. And then God offers to take the righteousness of Jesus and give it to you as a gift if you'll stop trying to earn it, stop trying to be good enough, and just believe. Somebody say, wow. That wasn't very loud. Somebody say, wow. Wow. Let me tell you something. This is hard to believe. So most people don't believe it. Most people believe the way you get to heaven is by being a good person. But to those of us who will believe, even when it's hard to believe, that simply by trusting in Jesus, not by trying to be good enough, our sins will be forgiven, then they will be. And God will make us right with himself. Not because you did anything, but simply because you believed and he gave you a gift of perfect righteousness. So a few verses earlier, Paul says, so by the way, none of you have anything to boast about. Can't say, hey, I got in because if I did these good deeds, look at me, hey, 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 I got in. Here's what I did to get in. What'd you do to get in? Nope, guess what? If you trust in God, if you put your faith in Jesus, you get no credit because you did nothing. You simply believed in God and gave you a gift. So it can't be, I did this good deed or that. I didn't do any good deeds. I would be in hell. God gave me a gift. Jesus died so I could receive that gift. Wow. And can you imagine, people have read this over the centuries and it filled them with joy. Look, 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 look. Next verse, verse six. David, Paul's now talking about King David. He spoke of this, what we're talking about, when he described the what, everybody together, he described the happiness of those who were declared righteous without working for it. It makes sense that would make you happy, right? You get something without working for it. Somebody gives you a million dollars is a gift. Is, does that make you happy? We already went through that. Okay, new stuff. Yes, okay, happy. If you're declared righteous and given righteousness as a gift without working for it, it should lead to incredible happiness. I'm, I'm right with God. I'm forgiven. I don't have to be good enough. I can just rest in him. He keeps going. Here's what David said. Seven and eight. Oh, what? What is the word? Oh, what? Joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven. If you know that all your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, what is that going to bring you? What joy? What joy for those whose sins are put out of his sight? What if by just believing your sins could be put out of his sight? Joy. Happiness. Yes. What joy? For those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin, what if you knew your record was now sinless? Not full of sin, but with no sin. What incredible joy. So you can imagine why people have read this over the years and they want to dance. They want to, I'm free. 
I'm free. I won't be punished. He's saved me. I'm right with him. All I did was believe. I get no credit. But I'm free. So what should your joy and your happiness lead you to do? Well, in Acts 16, a whole family heard this message and they believed. And it said they were filled with joy and they immediately got baptized. And I'm just saying, you should do the same thing. If you haven't already been baptized since believing, let your joy lead you to go, I'm getting, I'm, where's the water? Somebody give me some, I'm gonna get baptized. Why, you say, why should you do that? A couple reasons, one, Jesus said, when people believe, they should get baptized. Matthew 28, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we do it because Jesus said to. That's pretty easy. Two, getting baptized symbolizes that you believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's why we say when we baptize people, buried with him in baptism, you're buried, because if you stay underwater, what's going to happen? You're going to die, okay? We, we don't leave you under, okay? <clears throat> buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in a new kind of life. Symbolizes, I believe, in his death, burial. And resurrection. It's a symbol. Third, getting baptized is a public declaration of a new association. You're now associated with Jesus. And pretty much every example that I can think of in the book of Acts where somebody got baptized, it was in front of people. Could have just been a family, but sometimes it was thousands, like in Acts 2. 3,000 got saved in one day, they all got baptized together. You do it publicly as a witness. Testimony, I've been changed. I believe in Jesus. And four, getting baptized shows that you're serious about following Jesus. If somebody says, hey, I follow Jesus, but I don't want to get baptized because I don't want anybody to know, probably should question whether or not they really do. Because usually, if you'll get baptized, it means you're pretty serious about it. You're not ashamed of him. You're willing for people to know. And if you get wet in front of a whole bunch of people, I mean, you don't just do that for fun usually, okay? You do that because you're serious about following Jesus. So my challenge to you today, if you haven't been baptized since believing in Jesus or committing your life to Jesus, why not get baptized right here today? We've got people signed up already but you can just join them. Book of Acts, they probably just got baptized in their clothes. But you don't have to do that. Remember, we bought clothes for you. You're going to see the brand. I can't tell you. It's just great. You're going to see it when you get back there, okay? And so in a minute, uh, we're going to have you stand. And if you want to get baptized, you can go to the back. We got everything you need. You can go to our restrooms. You can get changed. Come back in here. Get baptized. We're going to take photos. You'll have them for the rest of your life. Videos you can share with family and friends. But if joy is welling up inside of you, do what they did in Acts. Today, on the spot, where's water? Ah, oh, we got some right over here. Where's water? Uh-oh, there's some more over here. We got some, okay? It's already here, and it's ready for you to get baptized. Let me show you a video, and then we'll do it. Take a look. I committed my life to Christ when I was in elementary. I remember before I got baptized, um, I was just really scared that the preacher was gonna ask me really hard questions in front of everyone, and if I didn't answer them correctly, I wouldn't get baptized. I didn't quite understand the method. I thought of baptism as something cool I got to do for me, not something brave that you do for God. After I graduated high school, I began to lose my relationship with God. I started to wonder if He even existed. It was a dark couple of months of sorting out what I was told to believe and what I really believed. Thankfully, God gave me a wake-up call. I just couldn't ignore His presence in my life, even despite all of my sin. I turned my back on God, but He never turned His back on me. I grew up going to church on Sundays when it was convenient for my family. There was no lack of faith in any of my family members, but it was not the biggest priority for us. I had raised my hand a time or two when the pastor asked if anyone wanted to commit their life to Christ, but I never really found myself doing much with that confession. It stayed the same for a while as I got caught up in my life, but for about three years, I've had this void in me, like something was missing. And I couldn't never be happy 
Before in church, I would be the timid and the quiet one when it came time to sing. But that Tuesday night in Eli, I found myself standing up with my hands held to the ceiling and I was singing loud with a smile on my face. Before we left, I checked the box that said I'm committing my life to Christ on the connection card and brought it to the Next Step Center. I felt this pressure in my chest when Chris was talking about spontaneous baptisms. I knew that it was my first test of faith in my new relationship with God. Jesus took a stand for me, and now it was time for me to take a stand for Him. I knew the time to stand was coming. I felt extremely vulnerable. This was way out of my comfort zone. Hundreds of people were there, and all the services are recorded. But I knew that that was the point. Jesus didn't hide from me. He came to earth to die for me. So why was I scared to get up in front of everyone and show them that I love Jesus and that I'm unashamed? The next week was full of thinking about my relationship with God and how much I just wanted to dive in. Then Tuesday came and I had the very same experience. And I realized my next step was to get baptized. But it was different. It was different because my mom and dad weren't asking me to go to church. This was all me. And my bashfulness would not stand in my way of doing what I needed to do. And I felt that God had chosen this point in my life to show me His love and grace so that I would know in my heart that I had been chosen to be brought into the light with Him. Getting baptized is such an intimate thing with God, yet at the same time, I felt like I was exposing myself to the world. I was still nervous, but the unity that I felt with everyone else getting dunked was incredible. If anyone feels too scared to get baptized, I say that's perfect. God calls His followers to do things all the time, and if you only do what you feel comfortable doing, you're going to miss out on a lot. Feeling vulnerable is good, because when you let your walls down, that's when God comes in. And trust me, you do not want to miss out on this. It's the most beautiful thing you could ever experience. Let me thank them for sharing their baptism stories. <laughs> Brittany said in the video, Jesus took a stand for me, and now it's time for me to take a stand for him. For some of you, that needs to be your story today, too. Maybe your parents had you sprinkled as a child or something, and their hope was that one day you would follow Jesus. And the Bible says in the New Testament, when you choose to follow Jesus, then you should get even rebaptized as a follower of Jesus. So I challenge you to do that today. We've done this many times in the past, and many people have responded, so I can assure you, you won't be alone. So let's take a stand for Jesus. At all of our campuses, would you stand up? Everybody together? Everybody, all of our campuses, stand up. I'm going to count to three in a second. When I hit three, if you want to get baptized, just exit out your row, head to the back. We'll show you where to go to get changed. You can come back in here. We'll worship and baptize some people here in a little bit. You ready? Everybody ready? Let me hear you. You ready? Okay. Here's the count. One, two, three. If God's calling you, let's go today. Put your hands together, church, for those going public, wanting the world to know they're followers of Jesus. They believe. They're filled with joy. And the natural response is to go public and get baptized. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. For more information about our church or to watch other messages, you can go to our website at experiencelifenow.com. Let us know if we can serve you in any way, and we hope to see you real soon.